He's always a good father. That's who we are. Join me, Luke 14. Let's get into the Word of God a little bit. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow. I don't ought to speak of the other service group of people, but I no, I'm I had to kind of pull that out of them this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Look at you guys are you've had warm up time. You've already been over to Lamar's and a couple of donuts. Yeah. Maybe a breakfast casserole over at Investors. You didn't have them today? Usually I figure there's something hopping and bopping over there. They got I know. You guys got it going on over in Investors. I know that. I know you only had the spiritual food today, didn't you? What, did you cover a little Genesis today, Doc? What do we get? Chapter 8. Chapter eight. Eh, there's nothing there. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Good. I'm good. <laughs> We're going to go Luke 14. Well, I'm, you know, we'll see what we can do to work it out in the Word. God's Word never disappoints. So we'll let the Spirit of God in the name of Jesus do the work here. Uh, thank you. Josh Bennett for teaching and preaching the Word of God. Uh, it's good to listen and hear. Aaron Estebane, good morning. Can I just, are you are you lost? Do you have some? Do you have any family members with you? Oh, there, oh my goodness! Hello, Estebane family. Everybody, say hi to Aaron and his family. Good to see you guys. Amen. I sure hope you're able to survive Missouri. So it's good to see you. So thank you for hanging out with us for a few minutes. You are a friend and family here, so thank you. And, uh, of course, this past weekend, uh, there was a funeral service, celebration of life for Fred Allen, and uh, so uh, had an opportunity to go to visitation on Friday night and a number of people there. And, and so uh, thank you, God. Thank you, Father, for being so good that... Uh, you would work through a man such as Fred and, and uh, his, uh, his testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ is what speaks best. And so that might be what we want to speak for us one day is just the witness of Jesus in our lives. And so thankful for him from a distance, knowing him. And of course, uh, the one neat thing is that I've had the opportunity to hear some great stories that very few probably have heard through his wonderful son, Dwayne Allen. And I won't speak of them, but there's some good stuff out there, and they are, they're classics, let's just put it that way. And uh, praise the Lord for, for that. And so uh, I know a number of people came in to recognize and to uh, acknowledge a friend, a brother, a pastor, a father, a grandfather, and the whole list of pieces and parts to a, a young man that went home to be in the presence of the Lord. And so thank you for Dwayne and Teresa and your faithfulness through everything and continue to pray for them and the whole family. There's a lot of people that are affected in the loss of someone that's been so important. Of course, Nancy Nation lost her dad a couple weeks back. And so just be praying for those around you and say, wow, those people that have lost someone. Of course, Brian, I think of you, your sister-in-law, losing someone precious and dear in your family at a young age. And so again, each and one of our lives, when we intersect in the body, in the kingdom, it's really neat to see how God can work through all that. And sometimes just singing a song and tears come or smiles come or claps come and you think, oh, I miss that person that's so dear to me. But I thank you, God, for having the grace and goodness to put them in my life so that I could spend all the years on this, on this, your creation all these years, and that one day in Jesus Christ we can be in him and with him, and that's, that's powerful and that's sweet. You know, we're talking through Luke's gospel, and of course we're in chapter 14, and we know Jesus has been through a whole lot in his earthly ministry to this point, and uh, he is headed to Jerusalem, and on his way he stops in a few different places, Perea, and of course, and Galilee, and through his ministry he's going to make his way to Jerusalem, and in chapter 14, we already have covered a little bit of ground a couple weeks ago, but again, as I mentioned earlier, thank you, God, for Josh Bennett preaching and teaching the Word last Sunday, and Brian Calloway a few weeks ago, and we have some very special, gifted, in the Spirit men of God that can preach and teach the Word of God, girls and boys, 
and teach the Word of God around here. Thank you, God, for people that are dedicated to learning from the Word so they can then teach others also. And I'm thankful that, again, we just finished up Mighty Mites and the team of people out there in Mighty Mites uh, teaching little kids t-ball and coach pitch, baseball, softball, but then, of course, seeing how uh, God uses them in the break times. And uh, thank you for the Brogans. Thank you for the Dickersons and Happy Five Soccer Club. Thank you for the leadership, the men and women that believe in the Word, believe in Christ, believe in Him being preeminent, the head of the body. He is our chief shepherd. And then being led by that to minister to other people. And, and that's who we are. That's who we are in the Lord. And I'm thankful for your mission heart, everybody. Continue to have that and continue to push through that. And uh, just a quick mention of something. Don't forget that within just a few weeks, in fact, be reminded and get on it, ADP Sports Charity Golf Tournament, another one of our mission work things that we do. It's not just a thing, it's part of the vision and mission of our church. Uh, get involved in it somehow, some way. Get out in the lobby, find a brochure, look in there, look on the website, and if you said, hey, I want to engage the mission and I want to be a volunteer, you can do that. Go back and look at that email I sent to you, church, last Friday. I made sure that it'd be about nine days ago that I sent an email out where you can be a volunteer. We've already got about a dozen people. We could use another dozen to be part of that mission work where you go out, play some golf. We don't take a penny, and we give it to, uh, uh, to a worthy cause this year. It's Plaza Heights Christian Academy, a second year in a row, that will help children to offset the, the cost of that education. So again, I'm encapsulating all that with really the life of our church the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and who we are in him and how we believe in making hope known. We are to make hope known. And that's where, again, we reside with Jesus in this study. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, and then some of those uh, interjections of things, Jesus Christ was at this point rejected. He was already called blasphemer to this point he's basically minimized and marginalized and is teaching by so many but on the other side he is loved he is needed we see that in the midst of his rejection he keeps on inviting people in the midst of his being pushed back on and and uh, accused of being a blasphemer he goes and he heals people he comes in and he says okay tell you what you get the sabbath you believe in the letter of the law here i am in the spirit of the law of healing and i'm going to heal this man that has dropsy the bottom line is this person has been crippled up for years and this person is healed as the beginning of Luke chapter 14 clearly shows us. Jesus teaches, he gives things, I mean, gives healing, he does miracles, and yet he is rejected and he is looked at as being the enemy when in fact he is truly the Son of God and the Son of Man, bringing redemption, bringing reconciliation to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. In the midst of that rejection, and we've looked at this type of teaching more than once in our study because it's come up today's title is very simple in spite of rejection invite i want to take a different look at this passage i've taught out of this passage a number of years ago and i'll mention that here in a little bit but jesus christ shows us that in spite of being rejected in spite of being silenced in spite of being falsely accused he continues to invite people to him he continues to fulfill his calling by his father his father said i'm sending you from heaven's portal to the earth in the womb of the blessed virgin mary i want you then to carry out all that i've called you to do but most of all my will is for you to go to the cross to die, to shed your blood for the redemption, for the propitiation, for all sin of mankind, to be buried and to rise again. You are headed to the passion, the suffering for me. That's what God sent him for. And he was rejected. We go through all that text and we know 
of course, in Isaiah's prophecy and all the things of Old Testament. Now we're in this place of Jesus being rejected again. I want to bring this text, these 10 verses, to light for you and me. In spite of being rejected when you witness. Now, I know rejection is a tough one here. All of us have been rejected for different reasons. Relationships, family, friends, church culture, workplace, rejection. I want you to kind of move to that place for a moment in your thinking about what it's like to give the gospel to people, to give the good news to people, to say, you need Jesus. I care about your soul. You need forgiveness. You need reconciliation. I, I know because I had to go through it. Can I tell you a story of how I was the wickedest, rotten person that I knew? And God sent his son, Jesus. And somebody opened the Bible and said, you can be redeemed. You can be forgiven. May I show you? And then someone says, no, I don't want to have anything to do with what you're talking about. You were just rejected. But it's who really is being rejected is Jesus Christ. But you're rejected because you're in Christ, and you're rejected for his name, and in his name. But think of Jesus, rejected. And think of the setting. He was invited to one of the chief Pharisees, the chief Pharisee's house, with the lawyers and all the other Pharisees and all the other people, and he sits down to heal someone, and they say, ha, ha, ha. And then when he asked them two different questions, they were quieted. They were at peace, and they didn't say a word. And then when he went to teach them a little bit about how they invite people to dinner and how they favor the people that can reciprocate. And he's teaching them, and they're rejecting his teaching. And then he says, hey, you'll be blessed if you go out and invite the halt and the maimed and the lame. And they, the religious few, say, ah, see? See, he must be talking about me. I am a wonderful man. I am probably the best Christian I know. I should go to heaven just on my merits. Don't you think? And that's the setting of these people. Fearfully, maybe that's the way we come across sometimes. God forgive us. We need to get that fixed up a little bit. Because what are you going to do in the midst of, in spite of rejection, Will you invite people still to Jesus Christ or will you say, you blew it. You cannot come to Jesus now. You rejected my witness. You're going to have to go off to hell. These 10 verses bring a lot to bear here today. Let's read them and take a peek at what God would have us to learn and grow in in our study. Verse 15, join me. Let me read a little bit. Make a few comments, four simple lesson points today within our point of rejection. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. What did this one of them hear in the setting at dinner? Well, they heard about Jesus at the feast in verse 13 and verse 14 saying, you'll be blessed if you just bring the halt, the maimed. And so this person saying, hey, I'm one of them. That's the setting here in these few verses. Verse 16. But then he said unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. So this is a story. It can be looked at as a parable, as an illustration, as a real life thing that's happened, or could it be just looked at as, of course, a future meal that's going to happen in God's kingdom. Think of this now. In this setting, there is a meal, this great supper that's been prepared. It sounds similar to one in Matthew, but it is different. Different text. Different text. Verse 18. 
And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Verse 19, and another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Verse 20, and another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. He said, hey, Lord of the house of the great supper, I've gone out and, and I've made the confirmation of the invitation to the people that have already been invited because in that culture, they already know about it. They just, now the servant's following up to say, are you going to come? You RSVP'd six months ago. Are you going to come? And the servant comes to his Lord and tells him, he says, look at what it says here about the master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. Here's that group of people, the hurting, the broken. Go out and talk to them. They represent so much of the populace 2,000 years ago in the setting of this story, but this is one of those that can be set right now. We can pull from this, and Jesus could be just sitting on us right now going, hey, in this setup of the dinner, of the great supper. And the master was angry. He told the servant, go get all these other people. Verse 22, the servant said, came back, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Now you know that servant is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ been sent by the master God. Jesus has been invited to a Pharisee's house and he did not reject. They are rotten people. They want to pull the rug out from underneath him. And he is the king of kings, the master. Rabboni, he's Jesus. They reject his invitation, yet he goes to their house where he invited them. Another incredible intertwined message that we won't go into. Look at Jesus showing that in spite your rejection, I still invite you to the most important meal, the most important invitation you could ever have. Verse 23 and 4. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden, shall taste of my supper. Let me repeat that last verse. I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. The Lord's teaching can be really tough, can it? A few years back, I did a little series called There is always an excuse. There's a little slide up there from some artwork a while back. Nine years ago, I walked through just these few verses for a few weeks. It says up there, there is always an excuse. Some of you may not agree with me. Ah, there's no excuse for that behavior. You say it to your children. Now, I'm coming to a place where my grandchildren are probably going to say, there's no excuse for your behavior, Grandpa. Will you please behave yourself? (laughs) My children are already doing it, so. But here's the thing. When somebody says that, I wonder, have they really got a handle on this? Because don't you think that there's always some type of excuse that comes up? Well, there should be no excuse for that. So you know how we do it. We're kind of fun that way. I have a really good excuse, so that becomes a reason. See, it's not an excuse. It's a reason. We're pretty good that way. So we reason. Come, let us reason. I, I have good reasons. But when you say excuse, oh, you're a wicked sinner. There is always an excuse. I pray. I must, I have, all three of those people. So if we're going to just look at that side of it, that's one thing. But just as part of an introductory place, I'm not going to go there. In the midst of the rejection, because 
they just didn't want to go to the meal. Bottom line is, they're rejecting Jesus Christ as the Redeemer. These people have said no, God, no to the Messiah. Jesus Christ has been rejected and will continue to be rejected until he says no more. And that may be for a very long time. You see, the rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ is commonplace. There are more people that say no than say yes to his invitation to salvation. It says in Matthew chapter number 7, you know it's part of the Sermon on the Mount, and to you in the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Yeah, I got you. Many people, there we go, in their eye. Verse 14, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way. Similar text has been spoken of in Luke's gospel, which leadeth unto life, and few that be that find it. There's definitely a lot of people that say no, more that say no than yes. And Jesus, as I said earlier, he has received the invitation to come to a house to a meal, and yet they'll reject him for eternal life, for salvation. You see, despite warnings and parabolic teaching, strong preaching, and compassionate witnessing, there are countless people who simply say no to being saved. Remember what it says, Luke chapter 13, the question that's brought to Jesus. Verse 23, then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, strive to enter in at the straight gate. There you go. Jesus Christ teaching and being right there, facing the matter of rejection and saying, there's a lot of people that say no. So does that mean we give up? Do we give up? I mean, how many of us have given up? I have. So many times I... You know how we get. Someone pushes up back against you, someone insults you, someone just says, I don't want to have anything to do with what you have. Or after the fourth, fifth, sixth time, a witness then finally said, I've had enough of your stuff. It's good for you, but not for me. There's times I've given up. I pray as I read through texts like this and God gets me, you know, the spirit just starts working on me and going, I gotta stop giving up on this stuff. We're so quick not to give up on our workouts, our jobs, our families, and on and on, but sometimes we give up on the people that have rejected Jesus Christ and rejected our words of the gospel. You see, we need to heed the words of our Lord and Savior as he rebuked the Pharisees on their status method of invitation. Hey, I'll invite you to Jesus if. I'll invite you to my meal if. As it says, and I said earlier in Luke chapter number 14, the two verses at the end of our passage we worked on a couple weeks ago, it has a lot to do with what I said in our opening a couple messages ago. At the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart, right? It's, it's often like that. And Jesus was after the hearts of these people at this meal. And it says in verse number 11 of Luke's gospel, chapter 14, for whosoever exalteth himself shall be <laughs> brought down and humbled, <laughs> and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You want to be abased or you want to be exalted? Because the Lord is the one that will exalt you. Our Lord Jesus Christ was persistent, to say the very least, to seek and to save that which was lost. He used many approaches to deliver his message of life and death. That's what I'm coming after here. This is where the Lord's left me today, led me today. When our witness for Jesus Christ is rejected, what, what must we do? What must we do? So I'm just gonna, just gonna reel off from this text, 10 verses, four things, four simple things that in spite of rejection, as it says up there, in spite of rejection, I'm gonna stay with it. Old J. Vernon McGee says in his opening little paragraph of this section, can you imagine the tenseness at this dinner? It started with our Lord healing the man with dropsy in the face of their disapproval. Then he looked the guests straight in the eyes and corrected their manners. Then he corrected the host. <laughs> Believe me, the atmosphere was tense. 
Nobody was saying a word. I'd have to agree with that take. It's kind of the way it is sometimes when you're at a get-together and you start talking about the Lord. You want to invite people to Jesus. So in spite of rejection, what do we do? First one, when people reject Christ, here's a place where there's this presumptuous confidence. I'm a Jew. I'm going to sit and eat bread at the kingdom of God's table. I'm a Jew. I'm of Abraham. These are those that believe that religion, religious affiliation covers them. Some people really believe that because they come to church, oh, let me go a little further, because your mom and your dad raised you in church and you came to know Jesus maybe sometime or not, I don't know, maybe you got baptized, maybe there was some type of confirmation, some, something happened, you know, and you're going, that's an, I'm good. Well, where I see that we have to hit that is we must witness with confidence. Confidence in what? Go to John 3 for a minute. John 3, you know the passage. Go to John 3. Go ahead, B, put up that first one. I got a few verses that I've got highlighted there. But John 3, if you go there, verse number 1 says, there was a man of the Pharisees, you know the guy, Nicodemus, he's a ruler of Jews. He comes to Jesus by night. He calls him rabbi, which means teacher, of course. He's relegated in his mind to a great teacher, a Jewish teacher. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So then he says, and of course I got verse 3, verse 6 up there. Jesus answers, a very, very, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know in this setting, what an incredible setting. I'm just coming up, I heard about you, rabbi, and I want to talk to you. Bam. <laughs> This is, though, a place of confidence in the word because you have to have a confidence in what Jesus said, not a confidence in you. This is really important. I know you're headed off to uh, take a bunch of people, Randy, to Honduras, and you're teaching them. Have a confidence in the gospel and the Holy Spirit. Don't watch out for having a confidence in yourself, right? Because we have to witness with confidence in his word. John 3. I'm, I'm going to use four references. John 3, Romans 3, Romans 5, Romans 6. That's your homework for this week. Get familiar with those four little chapters. There's hardly anything in them. <laughs> but I didn't say memorize them all. To get familiar with them. Because John 3's got some good stuff in here. He talks, Jesus goes, bam! We have to have this kind of confidence. When we wouldn't, do you know that you must be born again? Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. What do you mean, except a man... Be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I got you. Oh, that's what it is. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's which is born of the spirit is spirit. We have lots of babies born around here. That's a fleshly birth that comes out of the water that's in mommy's womb. You remember that, Seth? He doesn't know. He just went potty. He doesn't know where he is. When your wife gave birth, but that little baby needs to be born of the spirit to be born again, Yes? But it's been born of the flesh. When the babies are born, it's born of the flesh. Physical, but now spirit birth. You've got to be familiar with this stuff. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I got John 3.16. Thank you, Lord, for that one. And then you go into the next slide. John 3.18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. You see that key phrase, key statement? Believe on him. Believe not. Believe. Believe not. This is the condemnation that life is life, light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Get familiar with this. This is the confidence you can have in being witnessing, being a witness. You might get rejected because somebody already says, "Well, I've been going to that church all this time, and I'm good." And then you say, "Hey, I go. I know I got a guy named Nicodemus who came to Jesus because he wanted to self-justify." But he wanted the truth. You see, when people reject Jesus Christ, they have a presumptuous confidence in themselves. And you and I have to witness with confidence. Okay? Simple? Here we go. Next one. When people reject Christ, here's another supportive thing about in spite of rejection, we invite. There's a personal conviction 
Now, I know I use this word a lot here because conviction is like reproof. I, I like that. It's like, oh, the lights came on. I've been reproved of something that I thought I was right about, but now I'm convicted of God and what he's right about. Some people have a convert, com, uh, personal conviction over these things. They are those things that, that these people believe their daily responsibilities are everything. Look at verse 18 again in the text. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said, I have bought a piece of ground, I must. Verse number 19, I have bought five yoke of oxen, I go to prove them, I pray. So I pray thee, I pray thee, I must, I must, I must go. I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. You know, those are all summarized simply. When that invitation came, you were already aware of your status. You already had the oxen, you already had the job, you already had the work that you needed to go work them. You already had the piece of land because you went out and checked the land out before you knocked down and spent the thousands and thousands of dollars that you did. Or if you bought it at the Roman Empire from Denari, I don't know. Because in this setting, they have a personal conviction that those things that they believe in their daily responsibilities they're more important than everything else. Now, please understand where I'm coming from. I get it. The world that you live in, boy. You say, well, 2,000 years ago, it must have been easier. Was it? The Roman Empire is about to take them out. They're 40 years down the road. Jesus Christ is going to go in just a few minutes, by the way, a few days. He's going to the cross. So for those that believe in the Messiah, he's going to the cross with their thought that, is he going to be raised or not? And of course he was on the third day. But culturally, there's things that are very important. We need to make money. We have the Roman Empire over the top of our heads. We have to pay tax to the, the uh, Sadducees. We have the, the Pharisees. We, we, we have the temple. Ta we, we have so many pressures upon us. How are we going to make it? Well, here you are today in 2024 with mom and dad seemingly have to work, both of them outside the home, to make a couple of dollars to make ends meet. And so those things are important. But are they <sighs> the most important? They're not. Romans chapter number 3. It says in verse number one, what advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. He speaks boldly to the Jewish audience in the letter to the Romans. And there's the Roman church, they're the lost, they're the saved, they're the church makeup of people that truly have a Jewish background, they have a Gentile background, a, a barbarian background, a Grecian background, and he's laying it down saying, oh, you're better because you're a Jew? No. See, this is where you can witness with conviction because someone might say to you that my life is so busy, there's no way that I can get to being saved, born again, or go to church or do any of that, and you don't understand. So the very first thing that I said earlier was that, hey, my church affiliation, and I'm good enough, I'm, already, I'm, I'm definitely fine with where I'm at. The second reason why people don't come to know Jesus Christ as Savior is because they're just too busy. They're just too worn out. They can't come to the meal and they can't say yes because they have good excuses. And then when we're reproved as believers, then we come to witness with conviction. So we say, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Don't be ashamed of the idea that your personal convictions of life, they're no different than anyone else. But let me bring up an important matter. Spiritual things are important. That's what we do in our conviction of witness. It says in verse 20, therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Somebody showed me this stuff back in 1983. The winter of 82 and 83, I came to Jesus Christ. This past Monday was 41 years that I've been saved. That's powerful stuff. Someone showed me this stuff and it flattened me right on my back spiritually speaking i went are you kidding me i've got to get to the big leagues i've got to throw sliders i got to throw backdoor sliders for you that don't know what that is you know and you just i, I got to throw baseballs that's all i've got to do there's more important things brown you ever called out to jesus no i'm good 
I'm going to take a shot. I'll just, I'll be fine. Well, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. It says in verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. If you're here today and you don't get it or you haven't got it or you've never called out to Jesus to save you, you're still lost, you're relying on your church, you're relying on your religion, let me just tell you, I'm giving you a witness with total conviction because the word of God is what's convicting you, convicting me, not me whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, that's Jesus, through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Do you want to have your sins forgiven, Mark Brown, and whoever else, you can put your name in there. Do you want your sins forgiven? Then Jesus Christ came to pay the price for it. No other person can do it, no other religion. You call on the name of the Lord to save you. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves as the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're going to come to the end of yourself and say, I've had enough of me. To declare, I say, Paul writes, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. It is in him, in him alone, that you have forgiveness of sin, redemption, and reconciliation unto God through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. When people reject Christ, you come back and you tell them. Come back and tell them with conviction, witness with conviction. Here's the third one. When people reject Christ, we do it with compassion. We need to witness with compassion. Because people have this compassion. They've already, oh, thank you for feeling bad for me. Thank you that you have. You feel bad that I'm going to die and go to hell, but I'm going to be fine. I'm so good. So they already have their prepared speech. This is the other side of it. Now, I'll tell you, this is when you kind of get, I'm coming here with the love of Jesus. I've prepared my compassion. And then all of a sudden, they set you off. What happened to the compassion meter? Compassion. You and I need to have prepared compassion to match their prepared compassion of, oh, thank you for caring about me. Thank you for for telling me about Jesus. Thank thank you. I appreciate that. And you're going, are you just trying to reverse this thing on me? People did that to Jesus. There are those that believe their opportunity will always be available. I'll have a chance. I tell this once in a while, maybe once a year. My father's soul was required of him one night. It was around January 1 or 2 because I found his body in his bed gone. And uh, he talked, you know, my dad was thankful that I had compassion to care about him, but he never wanted to call out to Jesus to save him. Verse after verse after verse after verse. You've got to have compassion. Because, boy, as hard as someone can be when you are witnessing to them, you and I need to witness with compassion. Go to Romans chapter number 5. Simple, simple passage. I got it up there. I start out with verse 1. Therefore, being justified, made right by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Hey, if you're not at peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to call out to him and ask him to forgive you. And you and I that have, and we know that, hey, I'm born again, I'm saved, I've been baptized and everything. And you and I better get a measure of compassion like Jesus has because it's rough right here in this text. As Romans 5 is up there, just let me read something while you are looking at that. Because verse 21, I stopped at when I read it through. The servant came, showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets, maimed, halt. Go get them. Does not God have more compassion than any of us will ever have. Doesn't that God have more mercy than we could ever dream of? Doesn't he not have this long suffering to us? Does not God, is not God like that? 
And he says, in the midst of my justice system of having mercy and punishment, I say to you through the book of Romans, for when we were yet without strength in due time, God, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would, sh- would even dare to die. Next slide. You know, this is, this is how you witness with compassion. You open up Romans 5. John 3. Romans 3. Romans 5. Here's the compassion. You're reading about God's compassion. That just, it, to me, I read, every time I read this, I'm going, for scarcely a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, would, some would even dare to die. This is the compassion of God. This is the Lord who was angry and said, if they're not going to come to my invitation, then get the maimed, the poor, the halt, the blind, because I want them to know that while God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Show somebody that in your Bible. Carry around a little New Testament. Grab yourself a good gospel track. Just, just show them. Let them read it. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That just makes it so clear. Because wrath's on the other side of salvation. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's what happened to you when you got saved. That's what happened to me. That's happened to us. So would I not have compassion when I witness? Or when we get rejected, do we just say, eh, let God deal with them. Eh. God, forgive us for the conditional compassion we have. Lastly, I'll finish here. When people reject Christ, there's this powerful conclusion to the interaction on their side and ours. There are those that believe that salvation must be for someone else. This is another reason why people don't get saved. Not that they're just not good enough, but that that's for you, Michael. It's for you. Salvation's for you, for Randy. It's for you, but it's not for me. And so they have this powerful conclusion to the question, the interaction and the conversation. Hey, no more, Brian. I, I've got my conclusion. My conclusion is it's not for me. It's for someone else. Why don't you bring that gospel and Jesus stuff to someone else? Because people have their eyeballs in everybody else's heart and soul condition, but they don't have eyeballs on their own. There are those that believe that salvation must be for someone else. Now you must have, to me, you must measure that with the word. And here's your witness with with a great conclusion to me. Romans 6. Romans 6. Can't miss here. Just open it up and let it hunt. That's what you do. Just open that thing up and just let it go. Romans 6.12. Let not sin therefore reign in, your, reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. You read that to someone and say, I don't know, I, I learned from a good friend of mine, years back when you witness to people, this is as good a conclusion as you can have in Romans 6. Tell them what happens to them when they say, I want to be saved. You know how that sin's been destroying your life? It does not have reign over you anymore when Jesus comes and saves your soul. Now the Holy Spirit comes in, and you can't understand it right now, but something goes on for the next 20, 30, 40 years. It's called this sanctification. He's going to make you 
more like his son if you let him. This is a strong conclusion for those that say, ah, it's for somebody else. That salvation is for somebody else. Here's your powerful conclusion in witnessing. Because it says in Romans 6, 20, for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Now, I'm just reading this, and I hope all of you that were lost like me, oh, God, how he saved me. Oh, God, I don't talk about my lost life, and I never will, but boy, oh, boy. What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? And I am. For the end of those things is death, and he cleaned them all out. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. In the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's to me a witness of what he does to you and to me. And if you're lost today, let me just tell you, the salvation is not for someone else, it's for you. It's for you, because he can change any rotten person into a redeemed son of God, anyone. (laughs) What do you do when you get rejected? In spite of the rejection, we invite people to Jesus Christ. Here's our time of prayer this, this morning up on the screen. There are countless people who have said no to Christ. I repeat what I said earlier. And the number, <laughs> it increases all the time. Have we given up on people who just need an invitation? How do we handle the rejection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? How do we handle that? Why don't you stand with me? Debbie, go ahead and start our music in the background. I want to pray for you. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to pray over you. And maybe you'll respond in your chair right there, maybe up here at the altar, to what God is asking us. Are we going to give up and stop inviting people to Jesus? Maybe we'll commit ourselves in a deeper way to our witness. Father in heaven, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for how you've spoken to me and all of us powerfully in the spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for your example. I pray you just have your way right now. Move through us and in us and on us and and by your spirit, by your living word, Jesus, please reveal to us how we are taking things the wrong way. We need to clean up our witness so that we can, in spite of rejection, still invite people to you in Jesus' name. With the music playing.